there a motion to start the April 12th, uh, 2021 meeting? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Second. Great. Um, I'm a yes, Mary, all, uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. If we can, uh, okay. it we're good? Yes. Great, if everyone could rise, please join me for the pledge of allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, the nation, the God, and justice for all. Moving on to uh, public input what number one. If there's anyone here from the public this evening that would like to address the board, now would be the time to do that. Um, I would ask that you just either raise your hand or put your question into the chat room, uh, and then you will have three minutes. Um, do you see any hands or anybody, Mr. Fisher? We do. We have Kevin Martin. Great. Kevin? Go ahead, Kevin. Yes, hi. Can you hear me? We can hear you, Kevin. You have three minutes. Great, thank you. Uh, back in January, I asked the board where the money went for the park uh, since we didn't use the park last year. And I never received an answer. I'd like to know what that answer is. And um, I have a question for Jeff about the gym floor again. Still have not heard anything about that. Uh, when I met with you and Mr. Wilkinson and Eric Bramoff, um, everybody acknowledged that the gym floor was shot I don't understand why it needs to go to a committee to tell you, I don't understand how that works. And I'd like to know what's going on with that, please. So, um, Mr. Nichols? Well, with regard to the uh, gymnasium floor, uh, the last time that uh, Kevin brought this up, I think the response was that it went to the uh, building facilities committee and then they issue a plan and then that plan drives funding over the next several years. And Mr. Wilkin, uh, you're on the call. Am I correct in stating that the gymnasium floor uh, is scheduled to be part of that plan? Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, yes, the, um, the gym is in discussion um, to be put in the uh, five-year plan that we're working on now. Um, so uh, we're gonna take the needs of the whole district and um, separate them year by year what we're going to do and um, is it is it safe to say that in addition to the floor there are other elements of the facility uh, specifically in the high school gym that also need to be addressed yes uh, we were in discussion about the locker rooms the lock, yep. quite a few needs okay so the, the clarify uh, that for you kevin uh the process is because we need to do a five-year plan and then certain expenditures of the school uh, are required to be, monies are required to be put away se separately. Um, spending is uh, per regulation uh, and sometimes requires a vote depending on, on that amount. So uh, it is a process. We are working through that process at this time um, so that we can take all the steps that are, are required to accomplish that. Okay, back to my first question. Any answers on that one? And the question that you had, Kevin, uh, my recollection is that you were asking about the funds that were paid to the park and uh, whether or not those funds were treated differently because the district did not use the park in full last year? Yes. Okay. Uh, Brian, do you want to address that in terms of a contractual issue? Or yeah. Or is that or yeah, we can. The, the, the contract that the school currently has with the park, Kevin, um, requires that payment. It doesn't make for um, exceptions for COVID or otherwise, just as a lot of other contracts are. So the park money was paid to the park pursuant to the contract that we're obligated to make payments on. Okay. W would you think that this contract needs some serious overhaul? I'm not going to debate a public uh, a contract in public at this time because we're okay. actually bound by the terms that are currently in that contract um, okay. executed. 
Okay. Thank you. Yep. Okay, Brian, we have another individual. Yep. Uh, looks like Tracy Cavagnola. Sure. Hi, Tracy. Hi, how are you? Good. If you just give us your name, not your address, and you have three minutes. Tracy Cavagnola. I think the last question is appropriate because it rolls into an, an email that I was asking about. And as far as a plan, I think everyone that uses that these facilities would like to know what the five-year plan is so that we can anticipate and figure out how to best go about this. Because as, as we all know, there are several groups that use the facilities and we want to make the most of it. So I think I think this is a much bigger discussion than just a, a quick board meeting question, but I would like a quick answer if that's possible or, or how to go about maybe as a group putting something together so we can get on this. So I, I would just, just to clarify, the five-year plan doesn't relate to the park is, or, or are you relating those two together? You said that the five-year plan was about facilities for the school and the, the facilities for the, the school, school are the park. It is not. The facilities for the school are facilities, buildings, and property that are owned by the school. So that's okay. what is respect is related to the five-year plan, um, and that that starts at the facilities committee. Uh, it starts with an, a survey and inspection by professionals of the property for recommendations. Um, okay. That then works from the committee um, up to the board. Um, okay. The, the so park is not yeah. included in that because we do not own the park. Correct. Uh, my question would be then the payment that you make to the park, is there a group that gets together to say where that monies go? Otherwise, is it just a blink? It's just a payment to use the facility and you have no input as to what happens at that facility. So the, the input we have is is what's in in the current contract. Uh, we can't mm -hmm. tell them how to spend that money. We entered into an agreement with them to provide uh, a, a use of the fields, uh, and in that contract, it outlines what we have to do and what they have to do. And our obligation is to make a payment under that contract. I think that's that's what the question is. And now um, it has been discussed that contract is up, so that will be reviewed uh, in the near future. Okay. All right, thank you. Absolutely, and I, I did get your email. I did respond quickly because we got it this afternoon. Yeah. We, we will yeah. get back to you more in depth on that email. Just yes, thank it, you. the time ran out this afternoon. Yeah, like I said, I don't think this is a, a, a one question. Absolutely not. <laughs> nope, it's definitely All right. Important. All right, thank you. Thanks. Okay, Brian, I don't see any other hands raised. Okay. <clears throat> Let's move on then to superintendent's report. Mr. Nichols. Thanks, Brian. Yep. <clears throat> so um, I'm going to start with uh, 5.1, which is a testing update. So um, Friday, April 9th, we had uh, Enzo Labs come in and um, they administered PCR tests to a total of 136 students and staff. Uh, the results came back and we had one uh, positive test. So that's a pretty low percentage. So that's good news. Um, testing moving forward um, will be dictated by local conditions. So we're not, we haven't scheduled another test date yet, uh, but we'll monitor what conditions are locally. And if we think it's prudent to schedule another testing day, we will do so. A case summary at this point, we have set seven students out who have tested positive for COVID uh, and are isolating on quarantine. Uh, we have six students, four from the high school, two from the elementary school who are quarantining because of exposure to someone who tested positive. And we have one student who uh, had begun a travel quarantine, but that guidance has changed. So that student very well may, may be back in school tomorrow. Uh, I do want to note that the number of test positives amongst our students uh, has not declined. Uh, in fact, if anything, it's, it's risen over the last 
two months or so, uh, if you look at it cumulatively, what has changed is the guidance with regard to quarantining students. So initially, um, we would quarantine an entire class, the thinking being that if they were exposed to a student, for instance, seven hours in a day in one classroom, uh, we deemed them a close contact and we thought the conservative approach was to quarantine the whole class. Um, recent guidance from the Department of Health uh, suggests that we don't have to do that and that in fact, uh, we can uh, only quarantine those who we can quantify were within six feet for 10 minutes or more over a 24 hour period. Uh, that gets a little dicey and we've learned firsthand uh, from a couple of incidents, a couple of test positives a few weeks ago that that guidance is not ironclad. Uh, and we had a few students test positive from an initial um, case. Having said that, we are continuing to follow the revised guidance, but the Board of Education should know that the decrease in the number of students quarantining is really due to a change uh, in the county, Suffolk County Department of Health uh, guidance to schools. Um, any questions about that before I move on? I have, one, I have one question. Yes. Oh. Yeah. Um, yeah. My one question is just, um, if we want to, can we be more stringent than the Suffolk De County Department of Health. It seems like um, I'm aware of one per particular pod and you know middle school pod in particular that it seems like things are moving around and you know there could it, it would be perhaps appropriate at a certain point to quarantine the whole class a little bit. Yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to categorically answer yes or no. Um, I know that there's leeway uh, in terms of schools deciding whether or not to go entirely remote. Um, with regard to excluding a particular student um, from in-person attendance, I'd, I'd want to talk to council if it ran uh, counter to the guidance that was um, put out by the Department of Health. Um, but our we have done that previously, uh, exercised more a more conservative approach and I'll follow up with the attorney and get you uh, an answer to, a specific answer to your question tomorrow. Cool. And it sounds like based on this latest guidance because we can't necessarily we don't know if we can be more stringent. It's really up to parents to really take the prudent approach and if they know that their kid was in close contact with another kid, even if they weren't contacted by the school, they should probably err on the side of caution and come forward and and do what's appropriate and reasonable. Yes, and, I, and you know, I thank you for bringing that up because part of our revised strategy is, although we don't quarantine the students, we do contact all of the students' parents in a particular pod or class and let them know that there was a test positive in their pod or class uh, to make them aware so that they can uh, make a decision that they think is in the best interest of their child and family. Thanks. Uh, Chris, you had a question? I did, and thank you for that update. Um, kind of unrelated, but when we were evaluating whether to move forward this season with what was deemed as high-risk sports, there was the concern that sports might facilitate more spread. Um, I don't know if this is part of the athletic and wellness update or not, but I was just curious now that we're in that season and you know a, a good way into that season, if there's been any anecdotal evidence, whether it has or has not contributed. Tough to, tough to quantify that. I do know that um, a couple of things. I know that early on when we made the decision not to participate in basketball and wrestling, the experience in many Suffolk County schools was that it wasn't a sustainable endeavor and a lot of seasons and games were canceled. Uh, so that would indicate that in fact, um, that it was being transmitted vis-a-vis uh, -vis these high-risk sports. Uh, just today on the front page of the Wall Street Journal is an article um, that specifically addresses your question um, within the context of the increase in uh, the number of cases in younger um, students. And one of the primary uh, reasons for the increase, according to the article, and they reference some scientific journals, is, uh, is sports, community sports, and inter interscholastic sports. So it's pretty safe to assume that uh, they are contributing to the spread of the virus. 
And it makes sense with what we know about the science. So even if a sport is not high risk, for instance, a sport like soccer, if you have someone who bumps into another student or is exhaling forcefully and within three feet of somebody, there's a likelihood that if they're positive, they're gonna transmit that virus to somewhere, someone else. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, 5.2 is a, is a travel quarantine update. So <clears throat> uh, New York State was a little um, delayed in following some CDC guidance, uh, but they did announce on April 10th that asymptomatic travelers entering New York from another country, uh, US state or territory are no longer required to quarantine or test as of the 10th of April. Quarantine is still recommended for travelers who are not fully vaccinated who are, or who have not recovered from COVID within the last 90 days. So this uh, <clears throat> recommended versus uh, required puts schools in a little bit of a difficult position, um, but we go with what is required. So as of now, um, April 10th, you are no longer required to quarantine if you're coming from an international destination uh, or uh, another state. Uh, it's unfortunate that that guidance was slow in coming uh, and that it in fact came out April 10th because our school nurses had to really um, mediate and deal with a lot of families with regard to questions pertaining to quarantine. Uh, and they were put in a little bit of a difficult spot uh, telling families that they had to quarantine when in fact uh, there was a, a discrepancy between the CDC and New York State. Uh, but anyway, that's, that's the lay of the land as it is moving forward. Uh, 5.3 is a quick vaccine eligibility update. As of the 6th of April, uh, all New Yorkers 16 years of age and up are eligible for the vaccine. And that vaccine is limited to the Pfizer vaccine because the Pfizer is the only vaccine that's been approved uh, for use for 16 and 17 year olds. Uh, so Moderna is not approved and neither is Johnson & Johnson at this point. Uh, but for families uh, who would like to uh, get their children vaccinated, you can go to the New York State website um, and make an appointment for um, your child. A quick Regents update uh, and uh, state assessments. So there's been some changes due to COVID uh, the three through eight ELA and math assessments are going to be administered this year, um, but they are not going to be two days in duration. They're going to be one day in duration and specifically they're gonna be multiple choice. For, so they're really watered down assessments. The science assessments that are administered in grades four and eight uh, have also been cut from two days to one day. Um, the New York State Regents assessments, which are the assessments that students take uh, in high school courses, summative assessments at the end of the year, uh, many of which are required to graduate from high school. Those August assessments have been canceled. Uh, and students who uh, needed to pass a Regents and were scheduled to take those Regents assessments in either uh, June or August are exempted from taking them in order to satisfy the graduation requirement. So if I'm a high school student and uh, in the past I needed to pass a specific Regents exam in order to graduate, uh, as long as I pass the course, I no longer have to pass that assessment this year in order to satisfy the graduation uh, requirement. The only assessments that are required um, and they're required by the Every Student Succeeds Act or the ESSA Act, which is a federal act the only ones required this year are Algebra 1, uh, English Language Arts, which is basically the English Regents in grade 11, Living Environment, which many of you know is biology, and Earth Science. Uh, and New York State has appealed uh, to the federal government uh, asking for a waiver, and to date they have not been administered it. Um, so that's where we're at with regard to Regents assessments. And then finally, I added uh, 5.5, which is a quick update uh, on some interim guidance. I'm going to read directly. Interim guidance for in-person instruction at pre-K to grade 12 schools during the COVID-19 public health emergency. 
So this 24 page document was uh, issued by the New York State Department of Health on April 9th. And really the most significant piece of it uh, pertains to the potential reduction in social distancing from six feet to three feet. And so uh, as it pertains to the Sag Harbor schools at this point, it's not all that significant in that technically we're open for in-person instruction K through 12 right now. But if uh, conditions were to change, and let's just say for argument's sake in grades nine through 12, uh, more students wanted to uh, come to school every day for in-person instruction, we would be in a position where if we maintain six feet of social distancing, we could not accommodate all those students. And in fact, we'd have to go back to a hybrid schedule. So the natural question to ask is, does this new guidance, the six foot to three foot, change that equation for the Sag Harbor schools? And the answer to that is not really because embedded in the guidance are four um, transmission levels, if you will, as outlined by the CDC. And they're uh, blue, which is low, yellow, which is moderate, orange, which is substantial, and red, which is high. And basically the two metrics that define where you fall are the test positive rate and the total number of cases per 100,000 uh, in the last seven days. So in order to be a high or red uh, risk area, for a test positive rate, you'd have to be greater than or equal to 10%. We're all, we're, right now, our test positive rate in Suffolk County is in, an, in and around 4%, maybe low four. So we're not necessarily high risk in that regard. But the total cases per 100,000 in the last seven days is in the low 300s and anything north of 100 puts you in that high risk zone. So because our area is a red zone um, and we are unable to cohort at the high school level, we would not be able to go to three feet. And in fact, because of that red uh, labeling, if you will, uh, we would have to stick with the six feet. So that's a quick summary of the changes. Uh, any, any questions? Board members, any questions? No. All right, great. We'll continue on. Item 6.1, the principal's report. So we're gonna start with Mr. Malone because uh, Ms. Carriero uh, had her wisdom teeth out today. So she's uh, out of commission, but uh, we'll start with Mr. Malone. Okay, thanks Mr. Nichols. Good evening, everyone. As, as Jeff mentioned, um, the three through eight testing this year has been adjusted. So just to follow up on what Jeff shared, both the ELA tests at the elementary school as well as at the middle schools. So for grades three through eight, the ELA New York State test will be administered on Tuesday, April 20th. And that will just be the part one, which is the multiple choice. We sent a letter home about this over the weekend. And our mathematics, grades three through eight, so in both buildings, elementary and middle, we will administer the part one of the math on Tuesday, May 4th. And the plan would be to administer those tests right away in the morning once, once the students arrive and get settled, go over the directions. Um, the um, anticipated time of the testing is no more than an hour. Um, in past experience, I think it will take a lot less than that. And um, students should, you know, be comfortable with the testing and, and I'm sure they'll do fine. The um, pre-K program, we spoke about this at um, some of the previous meetings this year, um, included in the budget will be, which will be presented in May is a full day, full day support of the pre-K program. So we're really excited to be able to offer that to the families in our district of children who reach the age of four by December 1st. So for the coming 2021-22 school year, it would be children who reach the age of four by December 1, 2021. They would be eligible for our program. 
this Thursday night. So that's April 15th, this Thursday at 7 p.m. Ms. Reynoso, myself, as well as the pre-K staff will be hosting an orientation program, a Google Meet for those parents that wanna learn more about the opportunity for next year. And the link for the program is actually posted on our Sag Harbor Schools website on the elementary page. We also have sent this out to those that are on our mailing list and we'll be sending out the link one more time as a reminder before Thursday's event. Great, thank you, Matt. Um, board members, any questions for Mr. Malone? Okay, all sounds positive, thank you. I can give a quick update on the, the middle school, high school. Um, I already talked about the Regents and three through grade assessments, but I, I know that Ms. Carriero, Mr. Guinan and Ms. Westoff are busy uh, planning end of the year events. Um, there are a lot of culminating events that have been impacted by COVID from middle school moving up to National Honor Society uh, to high school graduation so, um, and the prom. So I know that there's a, been a committee formed by the high school, middle school administration, and they're working with parents on planning those events out. Um, with regard to prom, I know there's a call on the part of many uh, students and their parents to have it off site. The decision has been made to have it on site for safety reasons uh, related to COVID. And so we're in the process of planning uh, the event to be held in the back of the school with food trucks, um, and a dance floor built on the basketball court. And we'll try to make it as uh, student friendly as possible uh, while uh, of course adhering to the, to the guidance that comes from the Department of Health. That's awesome. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, board questions for Mr. Nichols on the fill in there. I know he's, he's filling in, so be light on the questions, but uh, if there are any, or he can get it back to us. If not, let's move on to 6-2 athletic and wellness. So I, I just, before Mr. Bramoff goes, I, I just want to note that uh, this has been a very uh, difficult year to be an athletic director because a lot of decisions have been made by me <laughs> as superintendent and the board um, in the interest of safety. And a lot of the programs haven't run um, that he's so passionate about. And he's done a wonderful job in terms of um, orchestrating or complying with uh, the Suffolk County Department of Health testing protocol and within this difficult environment being a, a great cheerleader uh, for our interscholastic sports program. So with that, I know that he prepared a, a video and I'll turn it over to him. Thank you, Jeff. Um, I would just advise everybody, I've been told that my I speak very loud. So when the video plays, turn the volume down on your computer a little bit. Um, we, uh, to answer, I believe it was Chris's question earlier, we have tested uh, the volleyball girls and we've had over 100 tests uh, for that, our in-house testing, we've had zero positives. That is the rapid test. Uh, I understand that it's not as in-depth as, as, as the PCR test. So um, we have had zero positive cases. Uh, Nurse Comber's done a wonderful job. We test the girls uh, every Monday morning and then it, if they if they don't if they don't get that test and they cannot participate for that week, uh, on the other side of it, with the football being the other high risk sport, East Hampton, our partner in the combined sport of football, tests all our athletes on a weekly basis as well. Uh, and uh, we'll be moving into the spring season on April twenty sixth. What I've been noticing uh, as a trend lately. Uh, is that the spectator rules have been getting more and more relaxed. Uh, we've stayed with the ones that we set forth in the beginning where we don't allow any spectators to our high risk events. And for the outdoor events, we try to limit it to immediate family members. Any, uh, any questions yeah. for Mr. Bramoff? Okay, no questions. Great, thank you, Eric. Well, Eric has a video. Eric, are you gonna show your video? Uh, I, would, I would ask if Mr. Fisher could play the video. Uh, are you on here, Mr. Fisher? 
Yep, I'm all set to go. Just um, once it starts playing, just give me a thumbs up that you can hear it as well, please, because I can't always tell that. So I'm going to start it now. Good evening. I'd like to take a few minutes to update you on the, the athletic program here at Pearson. While this certainly has been a year filled with setbacks and challenges, it's also been a year filled with success. Your Pearson Whalers are winning on two fronts. Our student athletes are enjoying victories in our competitions, but more importantly, they're enjoying the return to some sense of normalcy. I've stated on many occasions that athletics here at Sag Harbor is viewed as an extension of the classroom. Participation in athletics during a pandemic has taught our student athletes a heightened sense of resiliency and accountability to one another. It has also garnered a higher sense of appreciation for things that we may have taken for granted before the pandemic. When the decision was finalized not to participate in high-risk sports during the winter season, the basketball teams got right to work. They participated in off-season workouts in preparation for next season. We had five athletes participate in winter track, as well as five athletes participate in boys swimming. And I'm happy to announce that boys swimming repeated as league champions. Once the high risk sport of girls volleyball was given the green light, we initiated a testing program with the help of Nurse Comber, Ms. DeSanti, and the Suffolk County Department of Health. As you can see here, I think the girls thoroughly enjoyed the return of volleyball. Moving into the high risk sport of football, congratulations to East Hampton Sag Harbor football team for winning its first varsity game in four years. Bonnick is back, baby. Illustrated on this slide, you can see we have over 200 participants in fall sports. Our field hockey, boys soccer, and both cross country teams are now moving into their postseason competition. On April 26th, we will be transitioning into our traditional spring sports. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the Board of Education, Superintendent Nichols, and all the staff members who have worked so hard to give our student athletes the opportunity to compete during these uncertain times. I am happy to report that the Pearson Whalers are not only winning games, but we're putting smiles back on teenagers' faces. As always, let's go Whalers. Great, thank you, Eric. Good stuff. Any board questions uh, after the video? Nope, great. Um, Mr. Nichols, item 6.3. So we have uh, Ms. Bushemi's going to talk about budget matters and, and some changes to the revenue picture. So with that, I'll turn it over to her. Great. Good evening, everyone. Um, let me start sharing my screen and bringing up the presentation. So we did receive the final piece of information we needed to um, complete the budget development process. And really that was the state aid runs. And the final state aid runs were issued on April 6th. Um, the state aid runs did change the revenue picture slightly, but we haven't changed the budget side, um, the, expenditure, the expenditure side of the budget at all. And that is what the voters will be voting on on May 18th. So I know there's a lot of uh, press out there. There's a lot of news stories about state aid and many districts did receive a huge influx in state aid. Um, but unfortunately our district did not receive a big increase in state aid, but we did receive additional grant money that I'm gonna go over with you um, in the next few slides. So I don't, the additional- I don't see your slides, Jennifer, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, what did you say? I don't see the slides on my end. Does anyone, everyone else seen the slides? No. No one's seeing the slides? I don't. I, you I, are, oh, that's I, so interesting. Click on, I think. 
you are screen sharing. Um, I'm seeing the we slides. Can, it doesn't look share. like the, it's opened. It's so the presentation isn't open. Okay, let's try again. Let's I didn't mean to cut time. you off. I just didn't know if I was the only one. So no, no, that's interesting. Okay, let's see. So oh, there, you go. there we go. Now you see it. Okay, good. Let me just F5. Hold on, let's see. F5, that's going to happen. Um, it's not going to full screen. Hold on, just give me one minute. No, let me see if I can just do it this way. Uh, slideshow, this might work. No, I think I'm actually having a little bit of problems. Okay, so we're not going to have the full screen, but I could still talk about it um, with partial screen. Everyone can at least see the slides? Yes. yes. Okay. So. So back to state aid. So yes, so we did not receive a huge influx of state aid like other districts did. Um, mainly it was because of our uh, wealth measures in our district. Um, our wealth measures are much higher than the state average. Um, the state average combined wealth ratio is 1.0. Our combined wealth ratio is 6.2. So this did affect many of the additional aid categories for our district. Um, there, for instance, many districts you may have heard in the news received additional state aid to actually convert their pre-K programs into full day pre-K programs. And when I looked at, into it for us, because we're doing the same thing next year, um, it turns out that the funds were only available for districts who had combined wealth ratios of 2.0 and under. So we were not eligible for those funds. But the additional money that we did receive um, did change some of the aspects of what our tax levy limit is and other revenue um, changes. So our tax levy limit, which we were projecting in the past was originally 1.51 and we were gonna go out with a projected tax levy increase of 1.48%, I'm sorry, 1.5%. That has changed our levy limit now is 1.49% and our tax levy increase that we are projecting to go out with is 1.48%. So it's roughly a little under $8,000 less in tax levy that we will be able to um, uh, levy for next year. Uh, our tax levy right now is under the levy limit by $5,236. Um, as I said earlier, our budget to budget increase is still 1.22% and nothing on the budget side has changed at all since the last meeting on March 15th. Uh, the proposed budget of course is still under the tax cap. It is under the tax cap for the 10th straight year. All programs, instructional programs are preserved in the budget, extracurricular curricular activities, athletics, and we are funding the full day pre-K program for next year. Um, our tax, our budget, unfortunately, is still funded by 90% of the budget is funded by tax levy. And we do, as I said, receive very little state aid. So this is the state aid projections that came out on April 6th. And we, some of the expense-based aids were broken out. Um, as opposed to the executive governor's run that we received back in January. So back in January, um, they were trying to consolidate our BOCES aid, our um, transportation aid, uh, textbook aids. They were trying to condense all of those into what they were calling services aid, which was definitely less transparent for us because we were unable to actually see um, based on aid category, what was increasing and what was decreasing from year to year. So the legislative budget that was adopted broke all of those aids back out again. And we were able to see that we did receive some slight increases in those expense-based aids. Um, and we did receive an additional $25,776 in foundation aid. Our foundation aid is fully funded. So we did receive the minimal increase in foundation aid. Um, we, we also were allocated an additional $200,159 in grant allocations. And this was funded by the Federal Coronavirus Response and Relief Supplemental Appropriations Act, which was actually signed at the end of last year. And we received another $567,476 in grant allocations funded by the American Rescue Plan Act, which was actually signed uh, back in March. So this um, money now, this grant money, right now we're currently awaiting additional guidance from the State Education Department on what these grant funds can be used for. And we're also receiving some information on the application process. We have to find out where, uh, what the reporting process looks like. And um, there's a lot of strings attached to these funds. 
These funds are not reportable in the general fund. These funds are reportable in our special aid fund. Um, the special aid fund is, is, is not a voter approved budget. Uh, basically, all of our grants, our 611, 619 grants are accounted for in special aid fund. We also get Title I money, Title II, Title IV money that's part of that special aid fund. So we are awaiting further guidance. Um, these funds did, were not, we were not able to allocate any of these monies to pay for any of the expenditures in our, in our current budget that we're um, adopting at our next meeting on April 20th. Um, until we find out exactly what the money can be spent on, what we might be able to do is um, during the year, so during the year next year, we may be able to find out what we can spend the money on. We may be able to pull that out of our general fund budget, transfer it into our special aid budget, and then what would happen is we would generate a little surplus from those expenditures that would go ahead and be carried over into appropriated fund balance to fund the next year's budget. So we are awaiting additional guidance and um, we are very happy to receive this grant money. This grant money is supposed to be used for our, any costs that are related to our direct response to COVID um, as a district. Uh, the grant money actually can be um, not just for expenses going forward, but we could also be reimbursed for some expenses that we've already um, that we've already spent for the current year. So we're going to look back to see if we, we've already bought and spent a lot of uh, money on staffing and air purifiers. So we may, re we may be able to get reimbursed for that money, but it's still too early to say. So we are awaiting additional guidance on that. So this is now the revised tax levy limit calculation that was submitted to the state controller's office. And we did have to make some changes because our capital tax levy uh, basically went down a little bit more. This is why our levy limit de decreased from 1.51% to 1.49%. Um, our current year tax levy limit is much higher. Our current year tax levy limit was 3.1%. So it's amazing that over a one year period of time, we went from 3.1% down to a 1.49%, um, but the biggest reason for that was, um, if you look at the top of the slide, there's various factors, and the tax base growth factor, which was now 1.0103, that went down this year. Our um, capital tax levy exclusion for 2021 compared to our capital tax levy exclusion for 2022, that went down by almost $300,000 for debt service that we paid off. And we also do not have a transfer to capital this year. Our levy growth factor, which everyone calls the 2%, was not 2% this year, it was 1.23%. Um, last, the current year we were actually, um, we actually had a levy growth factor of 1.81%. So all of these re reductions from year to year really led to the um, reason why our tax levy limit this year is so much lower than it, it was for the current year. And this is the summary, the revised slide for our revenues and other financing sources. And what you'll see is, is that we did break out all the services aid now on the slide. So you'll see the BOCES aid line, the transportation aid line, you'll see the software library textbook aid all broken out as opposed to in the past, we just called it services aid on the executive budget. Um, so we did receive additional foundation aid, but remember that all of this 2020-2021 budget for state aid was actually much lower than um, the district was projecting to receive 20% less than um, what they were originally allocated because that's what the state education department was warning everyone at the time that um, you may not want to budget your 100% state aid allocation for the current year because we may hold back 20%. So even though it says here total state aid 1,484,797, if you go back to the actual state aid slide, you'll see that for the current year, we're actually slated to get $1,721,229. So all of that 20% in state aid was restored. So next year, um, we are looking to receive $1,850,264. And as I said before, unfortunately, this is a very small percentage of our budget. Um, this is funding just a little over 4% of our budget when, you know, there are many districts out there who received so much more state aid than we do. 
And um, our general fund tax levy at the bottom of the slide, you'll see is now 1.48% instead of the 1.5%. And that is really funding almost 90% of our budget. Um, all of, so all of the numbers on the revenue slide for state aid and are based on the actual um, state aid projections that we just received. Everything else on the slide, um, our non-resident tuition line, we, did, we were able to increase this year because we do have more students attending our schools. And on tonight's agenda, you'll see um, those non-resident tuition rates um, up for approval. And we did increase our tuition uh, rate by two and a half percent for next year. Um, and then going back and looking at the current year, I wanted to see how much revenue actually came in in non-resident tuition so far. And as of date, we've already collected more than a million dollars this year in non-resident tuition. So we were projecting $821,945 and we already received over a million. Um, for charges for shared services, facilities usage, this is really our, our shared transportation contracts. And um, we have, again, already um, collected almost everything that we budgeted for the current year. So for the current year, we budgeted $435,645. We've already collected a little over $406,000. So we're really on track to um, collect everything we budgeted for the current year. And we're definitely on track to collect the increased amount for next year. Um, all of our appropriated fund balance. So the difference is, so we did receive a additional state aid, but we're receiving a little less in tax levy. And what we did was we took the difference out of our appropriated fund balance. So in the previous presentation, um, we, were, we were projecting to appropriate $1 million for next year's budget. And that our current year budget is being supported by almost $1.6 million in appropriated fund balance. And we really wanted to bring that down to a more sustainable number. So um, we actually decreased it a little bit more. So instead of the $1 million that's being appropriated for next year, we're now gonna, we're projecting to appropriate $981,045. And this is the effect of the 1.48% tax levy increase on our residents in the town of Southampton and the town of East Hampton. And what we did was we went to both towns and we asked them, what is your median um, home value in, in your town? And the town of Southampton said the median home value was 874,800. And in the town of East Hampton, they said that the market or median home value in their town was 905,172. So we determined what the increase would be in their taxes for the year based on a 1.48% increase and based on um, their assessed value of their home not changing at all and equalization rates staying um, flat. And we determined that for the town of Southampton, those residents would see an increase in taxes of approximately $57.80 for the year. And for the town of East Hampton, those residents would see an increase of about $59.73. Then we went back and we determined what the increase would be for a house value to 500,000 and then a house value to a million so that taxpayers could go ahead and look at what those numbers are and they could actually take the value of their home and try and project what their tax levy increase is gonna be. And then also if any, anyone is wondering what we're projecting their tax, they, they also can send me an email and I could, I could probably um, determine what that would be based on assessed values not changing and equalization rates staying the same. So the, pro the proposed budget hasn't changed. Um, you'll see that we still have a budget to budget increase of, it's actually less than 1.22%. And um, the only thing that changed on this slide from the previous slide that was presented on March 15th was we added in the expenditure column here and we have expenditures here, projected expenditures as of today. And um, you know, back in March 15th, you would have saw those numbers being a little lower. And then we also included the um, 1819 numbers here also. So this was actual expenditures for 1819, actual for 1920. What we're projecting as of today, we still have many months to go, and um, we also spend a lot of our money, uh, especially in the employee benefit area, is really spent at the end of the year. So um, you'll see, but as of today, you have that column here showing what our projected uh, expenditures are. And then you see our budget to budget increase. And this is just a description of what's included in all of these areas. Um, the largest decreases, of course, are in debt service and into fund transfers. 
And into fund transfers, the reason why you see that decline is because much of our debt service payments are actually paid out of our debt service fund. So um, not only are we showing debt service on this debt service line, but we also have debt service reflected in this into fund transfer line because we transfer money into our debt service fund to pay off our debt service. And this is all bonds that were approved by voters um, years ago. And any other large increases are mainly in the area of employee benefits. Um, employee benefits is really showing the largest increase. And the next slide is the same budget, but shown by object or type of expense. And I just included the same information as the last, as the last presentation on March 15th, but I did update the column here for projected expenditures. I did include 1819. And I also sorted everything by the percentage of um, that expense compared to the total budget. So you'll see just going down, your personal services, which are salaries and your benefits make up the biggest portion of the budget. And then um, our contractual expenses, a little less than 10% into fund transfers, 4%. And then you could go down the line to see exactly you know, where the money is being spent. Um, contractual is really a catch-all catch um, type of expenditure. Uh, it really is for every, any expense that doesn't fall into any of the other categories. So if, it doesn't, if the, an expense doesn't have a specific category, it falls into contractual. So, and um, we do have the budget vote on May 18th, and we do have the four propositions um, that will be on the ballot. And we, proposition one will be to approve the budget. And proposition two is for the creation of a capital reserve. So there was a lot of talk tonight about a long range plan and much, much needed capital improvements. So having a capital reserve is really going to give us the mechanism of saving money and getting a lot of this work done um, without actually having to borrow and um, also uh, borrow additional bonds or uh, bond anticipation notes going forward. So right now we have a capital reserve, but it's expiring in May of this year. And we need to renew that. And um, the money that's in the current capital reserve, which is just under $3 million, will be rolled over into this new capital reserve if voters do approve it. And then we have Proposition 4, which is the purchase of another uh, bus that we need to replace. And then, um, I'm sorry, that was Proposition 3. And then Proposition 4 is the um, district clerk to conduct the registration of the voters. And I want to emphasize that the establishment of the capital reserve fund and the purchase of the new bus will not have any impact on the, on the school district budget or the tax levy because the monies that were set aside to purchase the bus are in a separate reserve fund. And um, the, that, is, that money will not, um, will not be included in, in the budget at all. It's accounted for separately. So we will have the budget vote and election in the high school gym between the hours of 7 a.m. and 9 p.m. Um, that's on May 18th. Our next meeting is April 20th. And on April 20th, we're going to be asking the board to adopt the budget. And we're also gonna be adopting the property tax report card, uh, which is required for us to send up to New York State. Uh, on May 10th, we will hold the budget hearing. And during the budget hearing, we're going to have a presentation that talks about the contingent budget and talks about what all of the um, laws are surrounding the contingent budget. Well, if the budget doesn't pass, what happens? You know, what do we, what, how much will we have to cut if we do have to go forward with a contingent budget? So we'll go all, through all of that on May 10th. And then um, I do want to let everyone know that we are having in-person voting on May 18th, but the law did change that um, now residents are able to request an absentee ballot. Um, and one of the reasons could be because they have a fear of contracting the COVID-19 virus. And uh, that was actually changed because there are only specific reasons where you could ask for an absentee ballot, but that was actually one of the reasons that was added. Um, so for those voters who are afraid to come in person to vote, they can request an absentee ballot. So I just want, so does anyone have any questions? Board members, any questions? Uh, Jennifer, thank you. I know you got this to us earlier in the week, so we were able to review mm -hmm. the presentation uh, and ask mm -hmm. questions before. But uh, as always, very thorough and uh, a good explanation, I think, to the public and to us as or me individually as a board member. 
Yeah. Uh, Thank you. Board member questions? I just have a quick one. This was great, Jennifer. And I want to thank the entire staff and, and administrative team and everyone that contributed. I know that takes a lot of cooks in the kitchen to make this meal. And it's, yes, it does. You did a delicious job. It's great. <laughs> um, just one little quick question that I didn't think of until you were going through the presentation because you made note of it, which was the additional tuition we got this year mm -hmm. that you were already. And um, you mentioned that we're, we've already collected a million dollars. Do you have a sense of where we're going to end up this year? How much do you think we'll have collected by the end of the uh, the end of our school year? Um, we are receiving tuition on a monthly basis. So, you know, I think that we are at the million dollars. So if we we do have some some people actually are a little um, they probably a little late paying us also. So it would be great if, if we could hit the one point one, you know, million dollar mark, that would be great. You know, mm -hmm. I think for next year, just speaking to uh, Wayne Scott, uh, speaking to officials there, they basically told us that they don't uh, foresee any big changes and um, also Sagaponic, they don't see big changes in numbers. So we did have 12 extra students this year. So um, we're, we are projecting that that pretty much stays flat. I think we might've budgeted maybe two less students for next year, but we really feel that that number is gonna be a good solid number. And if, have we seen any increase in paid tuition from um, out of district residents that might be in East Hampton or South Hampton or outside of Wayne Scott and Sagaponic, or has that been pretty constant over the, the past year or two? Um, I think we actually had a little bit of a decline in the parentally okay. placed, and um, and that may have be, been because of the uh, the COVID and because yeah. of the whole hybrid situation. And thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> Any other board questions? No questions? Okay, great. Thank you, Jennifer. Not hearing Jennifer. You're welcome. Oh, you're welcome. No, no problem. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, okay, moving on to section seven of the agenda, the consent uh, agenda. Is there a motion for consent agenda items 7.2 through 7.21? So moved. Is there second. a second? Second. Any Brian, I had a question. I was looking at 7.5, which is the chief school physician agreement. And in the agreement, are we having Gail Schoenfeld as the chief school um, physician or is it going to be uh, David Lado? I can oh, okay I can that. yep yeah so this uh, Yorgos was uh, a revision of the agreement uh, for the current year because we had council uh, look over it to uh, include or be more specific about um, who could work with our students Mm -hmm. So we did not change physicians mid-year. We just were clear, more clear about the number of physicians who could um, see, our, see our students. Okay. So in addition to Gail Schoenfeld, we also have David Lado, right? And one, one other person. Yeah. In this agreement, there's, there's other people mentioned, correct? Okay. But this is part of the existing agreement we already approved last year, right? Correct. For the remaining of the year. Correct. Okay. Got it. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other board uh, discussion or questions before we open the voting? Nobody, no takers? Okay. Uh, Mary, please open the voting. Please open the voting. Just waiting on Alex. Come on, Alex. You want to tell me your vote, Alex? He 
he stepped off screen, maybe he went to use the restroom or something. I would put him down as not present. Okay. That is unanimous. Great. Thank you. Uh, section eight, committee reports, if there are any um, reports for those committees. Uh, 8.1, the athletic committee. If not, uh, that's fine. The athletic committee has not met. Okay. We will carry know. that over to a, a future meeting. Uh, 8.2, diversity and inclusion committee. If anyone would like to give an update, if not, that's fine. We'll carry that over uh, as well if there's not an update. I was I was only going to mention that uh, subcommittees will be meeting this month in lieu of the general membership. And there have been leads aside to, the leads have been assigned to the subcommittees. So they'll be organizing the meeting date for this month. And then the general committee will meet in May. Great, thank you. Welcome. Um, 8.3, the policy committee. Sorry, I lost my place on the page. If, if there is an update, if not, we'll carry that over to the April. Thank you again, Ms. Reynoso. Yes, good evening. Um, just a brief update. Policy committee met April 8th, and we continue to work on the draft policy manual. The special education division, building and grounds division sections have been reviewed and edited and submitted for the draft manual. Health and wellness has gone through a first review and is now looking at the second round, bringing in stakeholder uh, stakeholders who could weigh in on those edits. And additionally, the personnel policy section has already gone through an initial review and it will be headed for a second review. Next policy meeting is next month and we're looking for more department updates for the draft manual. Great, thank you, Dr. Mears. You're welcome. Any board questions for Dr. Mears? Oh, okay, uh, moving on to, thank you. Um, section 11, public input number two. Uh, if there's anybody from the public that would like to make a statement, ask a question uh, of the board, now would be the time to do that. You can raise your hand or put your question into the chat box and you'll have three minutes. Mr. Fisher. There are no hands raised. Okay. Um, on to section 12, item 12.1. 12 Is there a motion to convene into executive session to discuss pending litigation, collective bargaining negotiations, and contractual matter. So moved. Thank you, Chris. Is there a second? Second. Great. Thank you, Jordana. And if you could open up the voting, please, Mary. That's unanimous. Great, thank you. I, I did see, uh, just board, I did see one question pop into the box, so we, we can address that before. Um, question, Mr. Nichols, is from Tracy Mitchell, and it says, has the prom idea been decided as a member of the community? That was first I heard. Uh, I know that Ms. Carriero has been meeting with the committee and in her discussions uh, with me, I've emphasized to her that I am not comfortable um, with uh, the prom being held uh, off premises for safety reasons. Uh, I don't know if she's communicated that to the committee yet, but um, that was my directive to her to share with the committee. Great, so that there is going to be a prom, uh, but it will be on site uh, and the details to be worked out. Correct. Great. We will update the public um, as we know. Uh, I just want to say that um, I think Terry Federico's in the chat room and she she's part of that committee. She and I think there was a meeting from what I've heard. You might want to let her give an update since Brittany's not here and Terry was there. Sure. Can we unmute Terry, please, Mr. Fisher? All right, just give me a moment. Sure. Go ahead, Terry. You need to unmute your mic. <laughs> okay. Hi, everybody. Terry Federico. I am the co advisor for the senior class. Um, so we have been throwing out some ideas for the prom. Um, and this, the 
we had a student um, committee meeting today. So they're trying to narrow down their ideas for um, theme and the ideas for the food truck where they're trying to be um, you know, realistic under all the circumstances. We will be having another parent meeting next week. Um, so we're, the kids are in the process of finalizing what they want it to look like. They're excited to have it at the school. Uh, we did take a poll uh, last week and 71 of 74 students, um, two weeks ago, 71 of 74 students responded, uh, which was fantastic. And the majority felt they were grateful for whatever we could put for them um, and um, wanted it at the school if that's where we were able to have it. So it's still, everything is still a work in progress. We're gonna see what the kids want, um, let them figure it out within our guidelines. And then we will um, definitely be meeting with the parents again to pull them in, but we really wanna know what, what um, the students really are looking for. And they appreciate everything that we're trying to do for them. So thank you. Great. Great, Thanks. thank you, Terry, for the update um, and, and Sandy for recommending that. I think it's great for everyone watching. Okay. Okay. Um, having passed that, just just for the public to note, the board passed the motion to go into executive session mm -hmm. uh, to discuss executive matters. We're going to do that now. When we come out of executive session, no action will be taken by the board, with the exception of voting to close the public meeting. So, uh, for the public, this is the end of the meeting, and and no other action by the board will be taken. For board members, I would ask you to log off and log back into the executive link, and I will see you there. Thank you. Thanks. Have a good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Thanks, everybody.